Hello, so now I would like to welcome Professor Sophie Scott. She is a director of the Institute for Cognitive Neuroscience at University College London, where she is also group, group lead for the Communication Speech Lab. She is an internationally recognized researcher into the neurobiology of human vocal perception and production. Her work addresses both verbal and nonverbal aspects of vocal communication from sound to social meaning and from speech to laughter. She was the 2017 Royal Institution Christmas Lecturer. So here, over to you, ma'am. Okay, it's, does that, is that recording? Yes, we're recording. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. And I'd like to talk to you about brains and communication and friendship and social networks and why these things matter for our health and how we can think about some practical things we could actually do to improve that. So we know that social networks matter. They matter a great deal for our health. So the bigger your social network, the number of people that you have social connections to and the stronger those connections, the more likely it is that you'll have better physical health, you'll have better mental health, you will have greater longevity. So it's associated with a longer life. And there are some quite interesting details within this. So one of the things that's very important isn't just like knowing a lot of people, but actually having friends, people that are particularly close to you, people that you can you will make an effort to try and see. And this is quite an interesting, what's called a path analysis, looking at the relationship between the number of friends somebody has and their connection socially. So you see a strong relationship between the number of friends somebody has and their amount of community engagement, their trust in that community. And uh, it sounds silly, but regular social eating. And it's important for humans to share these moments. It's Eating food together is more than just consuming calories it's an important social occasion and this mediation of community engagement and regular social eating along with number of friends and trust in community is strongly associated with really important factors like life satisfaction feeling that life is worthwhile and overall happiness so these are very important factors for our our social and emotional worlds but it's even this is just a lovely quote. In essence, having more close friends and eating more meals with other people have positive effects on satisfaction with life, happiness, sense of engagement with and trust of one's local community. So it does seem to really matter for people's lives. And if we look into this in detail, friendship seems to have very beneficial effects on our health in a number of specific ways. So this is more specific than the, the larger social network. So having friends gives you some protection against mental and physical illness. The more friends you have, the less of these illnesses you have. And when you do fall ill, the more friends you have, the more likely is that you will recover quickly. Or if you have surgery, you will recover from that more fast. Having friends makes you feel happier and more contented with your life. Actually, having friends and close family members is the, has the biggest effect on susceptibility to disease and the risk of dying than anything else except giving up smoking. Now that's normally framed as loneliness. Loneliness is one of the most dangerous things for us other than giving other than smoking. But, but the inverse of, not, of, of loneliness is the opposite of loneliness is friends, having many friends. So it's the friends that seem to be the mechanism that give you this protection. And it's not just the case for us. We find this in our other primates. We are primates, but you see, and you can start to see more of this, the mechanisms with other primates. So, for example, female baboons who have more friends, i.e. other um, baboons who will groom them, they have lower cortisol levels. They have more offspring and they live for longer. Now, cortisol is interesting because it's a stress hormone and it suggests that the more friends you have, the less stressed you are, which is, of course, big implications for health. Now, how are friends having these effects in humans? Well, one of the ways that friends can help us is just by directly giving us assistance when we need them, when friends are the people that you can turn to when you need help. The friends are more than that. So friends are also the people with whom we are having opportunities to do things that upregulate the endorphin system. And what that means is the body's natural painkiller is taken up more by the body and the brain when you do these activities. And these are things like physical contact, laughter singing dancing 
things that feel good, things that you tend to do with other people that you're close to, and things that do have this effect on your endorphin system. And there is some suggestion that this effect on the endorphin system may itself have an impact on the immune system. Now, this is all still work that's being sort of investigated, but it, that would actually draw a line between friendship and actually the function of your immune system. Now, it's not just that we are around these friends and we know that we're friends. One of the things that is key to friendship is actually the people that we will talk to and that we want to talk to and we want to spend time talking with. So communication itself is very, very central to friendship. And I want to start thinking about how humans communicate now. Now, humans are mammals. Mammals have a lot of different ways of communicating with their voices and their faces. We are primates. Primates have even more complex sort of use of facial expressions for communication. But something really dramatic that happened to humans in their evolution is that at a certain point, we started to walk upright. And that's had huge effects on the human ability to do lots of things. For example, our hands are amazing tools that we can use for an incredible variety of very important reasons that that's made possible because we walk upright. We don't need to use our hands for actually moving around the world. They're freed up to become these instruments. And something else that's freed up when we start talking, or sorry, when we start walking upright, is actually the human torso. And although we don't think about it too much, actually this is very, very important to communication. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why that is. So this is someone talking. And actually, this is comfortably the most complex sound in nature. There is nothing else really in nature like the human voice. And interestingly, we just adapted different mammalian structures of the vocal tract and the mouth to help us do this. We haven't evolved new things. And what you're actually doing when you're speaking is you're using your rib cage. So that's that rib cage, the structure that um, is, is encasing the, the heart and the lungs. And you're using to pull air in and out by <sighs> for breathing, for staying alive. Because we walk upright, we don't have to use our rib cage as all other mammals do on land to support our weights. We've freed up our rib cages. And one of the things that's a consequence of that is that we can ha we have a different sort of breath control. We can use our breath to do other things. And one very important thing we do is we, instead of just breathing for staying alive <sighs> like that, we can take a breath in and then produce a very finely controlled flow of air. And what we're actually doing when we do this is down here at the larynx, at the voice box, we're producing a constant flow of air that we're actually using to vibrate the vocal folds together and make a sound. So walking upright is giving us this incredibly fine control over the sorts of sounds we make here at the voice box. And then we're shaping these sounds with all our articulators, the tone, the lips, the jaw. And if we look again at these movements, Look at how much the tongue is moving. Look how much the lips are moving, the soft palate. The jaw is moving up and down. So this incredible complexity here from the rib cage upwards is underlying this incredibly complex sound that we make when we, we, we produce speech. So this is not just because we walk upright. Our faces are a different shape. We have flatter faces. We have these mobile tongues. We have a domed roof of the mouth. And all of these have contributed to our ability to produce this incredibly complex sound. But it's not just speaking. When we start using our voices, we actually convey a lot of different information. I made this slide before the recent, shall we say, uh, unhappiness in the British royal family. Um, but here we've got Charles and Camilla and William and Harry. And when we look at people communicating, there's actually a lot of different information that we can get from how humans communicate and the sorts of things they're communicating. So when we com interact with each other, we are, our, we are conveying information about our identity. And we can do that with the face. And we do that, of course, with our voices. Part of what happens when we're speaking is we're letting people know who we are. There's also information about emotion. So there you've got Camilla and Harry both laughing and looking happy. And also, of course, you can see there William and Charles are both speaking. There is well, certainly Charles. So all of that information is there. And these are very important parts of the ways that we communicate information with our face and with our voices. Traditionally in psychology, we tend to study the, the, the face side of things more. Um, but if anything, the voice is somewhat more complicated. So um, when you hear someone speak, if you speak the same language as them, it's very likely that you will be able to understand the, the words that they're saying, but you'll also have a very good guess at their age, just from what they sound like, their sex, are they male or female, their health, 
lots of different health conditions have very profound effects on the voice. Some um, You can even tell if someone has a, a broken leg from how they talk because they will hold themselves differently and that will affect what their voice sounds like. You have different effects on uh, a mood on the voice. So different emotional states will affect what your voice sounds like. And geographical origins and your socioeconomic status. We learn how to speak. We learn how to use our voices. And that reflects the voices that we've heard around us growing up. And it means we all speak with an accent. We all speak with some indicator of our socioeconomic status as well. In the UK, that would often run down to how posh you sound. Also, voices are something that will change depending on who we're talking to. So um, our voices will often express our affiliations with other people and our affection for other people. The more you like the person you're talking to, the more you will change your voice to be like theirs. And this is something I'm going to come back to. So voices are very truthy. There's a great deal of um, a great deal that we give away about ourselves when we're talking. And um, I think that's quite interesting when you think about uh how we use voices for communication because actually that we do mostly speak when we are with other people so it's something that is primarily living in social interactions and that means that it's a it's a very truthful signal in those interactions now of course psychologists and scientists like me have studied speech and how we produce speech and how we understand speech for hundreds you know hundreds of years and this is the very classic picture that you'll get if you look at the the neuropsychological literature, you've got these areas in the front of the brain associated with the production of speech, and these areas towards the back of the brain associated with the perception of speech. That in fact, it is more complicated than that. So this is one of the very first studies that I was ever involved in um, doing brain imaging studies of human speech perception. And actually, although the classic picture that we get from neuropsychology is that it's something very left lateralized, what we first saw was something very confusing when we first started looking at this issue, because when we played somebody's speech and then we looked at what was happening in their brains, we didn't see a left lateralized system. We could actually see a strongly bilateral system. And it took many, many years for me to realize that that's because there's more than just language there. As soon as you hear someone speaking, there's all this other information there. So yes, there's language, but there's all this other information in the voice. And very, very crudely, this activation on the left side of the brain is, is very strongly associated with the linguistic aspects of what you're hearing, the speech sounds, the words, the sentences. And the right side of the brain is very, very interested in all the other information we convey as soon as we start speaking. In fact, if anything, there's slightly more activation associated with that. And of course, it's not the end of the story. So when you are listening to someone speaking, what you're doing is you're also engaging the larger network of language areas to help you understand that. So this is just a study showing the difference between um, listening to a very unpredictable sentence and a very predictable sentence. So a predictable sentence in English would be something like the ship sailed across the sea. And every word there is kind of predicting the next word. If you hear ship sailed, is quite a likely word that you're going to hear next. Um, whereas unpredictable sentences like Sue discussed the dive are harder to understand because those words are all unpredictable. Unless you know something about Sue, you've got no way of knowing that diving is going to turn up in that sentence. Now, this has a big effect on everybody's understanding of speech. But as soon as you have you're not a native English speaker or you are in a noisy room or the person that you're talking to is harder to make out then this kind of contextual effects really really are very noticeable and what we found here is that when context helps you so you're actually able to use this bigger language system to work out what is being said you get lots of activation jumping out across the brain now basically showing you a lot of a very left lateralized network is helping you use context to understand what somebody is saying it's just not a one-way street of hearing the speech sounds and working them out you've got this language system trying to help you work out and that's a huge part of what's happening when we're listening to each other we are always trying to work out what other people are saying in terms of their words it's very very important and it's happening without you in paying any attention to it that's how automatic we have learned to do this but it's not the only thing we're doing when we listen to people talking so this is a study where we had um these are all english speakers listening to english and we manipulated the how intelligible the speech was but we also manipulated uh the pitch of the voices so English is not a tonal language, but like all languages, it uses pitch and pitch variation as a way of inflecting meaning and novelty and stress and syntax and all sorts of things in speech. And what we found here 
is that if you flatten out the speech, so it sounds more like that. What you find is there's a great deal of activation again in these right hemisphere parts of the brain associated with the natural prosody, the natural music of speech, whereas the left side of the brain really cared about how intelligible the speech was. So you're seeing the right side of the brain is very interested in speaker information, but it's also just very generally interested in the, the musicality of speech. And of course, it's a very important part of how we understand each other. Exactly how something is said will have an enormous influence on what we interpret it to mean. We are always trying to use this, the music of speech to work out what a speaker's intention is. So if someone says, I don't want to go, or I don't want to go, or I don't want to go, or I don't want to go, those all actually mean different things for British English speakers based entirely on the music of the speech. And that's what the right hemisphere cares about as well. And of course, often we are not only in a situation where we are hearing a speaker, very often we are seeing a speaker as well. And if you can see a talker as well as hear a talker, it helps you understand their voice better. It helps you understand what they're saying better. But when we're looking at this, we don't just have a face that's moving that's helping. We also use eye gaze. So people use eye gaze very, very carefully in conversations to indicate all sorts of things. Like I'm talking to you, I'm talking about him. And it's an important part of working out what someone is talking about and this is a study where we found we had people had people listening to speech either talk is looking down looking at them looking away or her eyes are covered and what you find is this intelligibility network in the left hemisphere is more strongly driven when the talker is looking at you so the only difference here is visual and it doesn't make the speech more intelligible but if a talker is looking at you that speech perhaps is directed to you and it becomes more salient We also see other things associated in the brain when we listen to things to do with voices. So this is a study where we were having people listening not to speech, but to emotional vocalizations. So sounds like laughter or cheering or horrible frightened sounds, screaming sounds or disgusted sounds. And what we found was what looked like a very strong effect in what's called orofacial mirror regions up here in green. And those are associated both with hearing sounds and also with moving your face ready to make a sound. And that was quite interesting because there's a lot of interest in this idea that we kind of embody our representations to understand the sound you're thinking about how you would make that sound in order to produce it. But very strikingly, it wasn't the case for all the emotions. It was much stronger for the laughter. And that was interesting because laughter is a slightly unusual emotional vocalization in that it's behaviorally contagious. You can catch a laugh from someone even if you don't know why they're laughing. And in fact, you can consider laughter almost to be a behaviour that is primed by the presence of other people. You're 30 times more likely to laugh if there's other people around you. So other people prime laughter and then you're quite likely to catch that laughter from people. And you're much more likely to catch laughter from someone you know than someone you don't know. So there's a very strong kind of um, environmental context on this expression of the emotion. And we wondered, is, is this what we're seeing here? When people hear laughter, are they getting ready to join in in a way that they're not? And they hear someone going, Ugh. They might experience some of that emotion. They don't start making the sound. And of course, we know that in the real world, this is a very important use of laughter. Very often, as I say, when we laugh, we're laughing just because other people have caught the laugh from each other. Um, and that's an example I'm going to play you here. So this is from a cricket commentary. And I hope I don't need to explain cricket. I normally need to, if I give this talk in America or Europe, I have to explain what cricket is. Um, so these are two men talking about that day's cricket on the BBC. And one of them makes a terrible joke, really bad joke. What I want you to do is listen out for what happens to the voice of the man who's talking, who doesn't make the joke, because he's affected by the joke. He starts smiling. The man who makes the joke starts laughing. So have a listen to that. So this is a picture of the voice shown down here. He knew exactly what was going to happen. He tried to step over the stumps and just flicked a bail with his, with his right he hand. He to tried to do the splits over it, and unfortunately uh, the inner part of his thigh must have just removed the bail. He just, just didn't quite get his leg over. Anyhow, he, he... A terrible joke. Now listen to Brian Johnson, who carries on speaking. The pitch of his voice has gone up because he's smiling. He did very well indeed, batting 131 minutes and hit three fours. And um, then we had Lewis playing extremely well for his 47 not out. Agus, do stop it. Uh, the other man's laughing. And, uh, he was joined by De Freitas, 
who um, was in for 40 minutes, a useful little part ship there. Uh, they put on 35 in 40 minutes, and then he was caught by Dujon Walsh. Now, at this point, he takes a breath, and now when he starts to laugh, the laughter contagion gets him, and he starts to laugh. Sorry, when he starts to speak, the laughter contagion gets him, and he starts to laugh as well. No. And you'll start to hear all these ridiculous noises he starts making. The pitch his voice shoots up. There are whistles and um, spasms. Lawrence, uh, always entertaining. Barely for 30, 35. 30, 35 minutes. Hit a fall over the wee keepers. Beggars, <laughs> for goodness sake, stop it. Jonathan Agnew tries to speak, the man who made the joke. Yes, Lawrence. <laughs> Completely <laughs> fails. Brian Johnson comes back. <laughs> he hit a four over the wee keeper's head. <laughs> and he was out from the eye. A tuffle came. <laughs> Batted for 12 minutes. And then was caught by Haynes on Patson for two. And there were 54 extras. And he them all out for 419. I've stopped laughing now. So that's a very lovely example of, of quite naturalistic laughter. There's nothing forced there. But it's interesting to note two things. First of all, they don't want to laugh. This is a live BBC sports broadcast. And the BBC does not like newsreaders or um, sports broadcasters showing emotion. It's called breaking. And they will get in trouble for this. And they did get in trouble for it. So they don't want it to happen. The power of the laughter it means they can't actually stop it. And the other thing that's quite striking is that almost immediately they're not laughing because the joke is funny. It's a terrible joke. It's not a very funny joke. They are laughing just because they're both there and they're both laughing and they're just setting each other off. This contagion is jumping back and forth. Now, at the time, the BBC were very cross about this and made them apologise. Um, now, of course, the BBC will play this clip whenever it gets an opportunity, because now with the distance of time and the older gentleman, Brian Johnson, passed away some time ago. Um, I think you also get the, like, you can pick up from this that if those two men had absolutely hated each other, they wouldn't have been laughing like that. What you're seeing is their closeness being marked by the degree of this laughter contagion. They are just laughing like that because they're both there. They're both laughing and they kind of like each other. So the, the friendship is amplifying this. Here's another example of like the power of laughter. So this is somebody trying to do a broadcast again on the news. So this is a, the Today programme. Um, what you're going to hear is someone coming down the line and then you'll hear, he says a, a name that's a bit funny for British English speakers. Listen to what happens to the voice of the woman who starts to read the news. Singer Rock's unpopular replacement has now been dismissed with the army's popular chief of staff, Jack Twat, taking over. A 40-foot sperm whale, which was stranded in the Firth of Forth for more than four days, is now thought to be swimming towards open waters again. It freed itself late last night. Marine experts are hoping to establish this morning whether the whale is finally back at sea. Good luck to the whale. Ten past eight is the time. An investigation is underway at the meet. So... That's, again, somebody talking on the radio who does not want to laugh. And now this isn't just contagion. Someone is trying to make her laugh. The guy coming down the line has got to say a silly name. He's got to say Jack Twat, and he just goes for it. That's a bit rude in English. Someone here in this gap whispers to Charlotte Green, who's about to start reading the news headlines on BBC Radio 4's flagship programme. They whisper Jack Twat at her, and they're trying to make her laugh. And it takes a few beats and then the laughter gets her and you start to hear her lose the control. All that lovely control of the pitch of the voice goes. Then she starts making these high pitched sounds. And then by the end, she's carried on making noises after she has tried to stop speaking. So this is interesting in two ways. This is telling us something about the power of laughter. Again, she doesn't want to do it. She'll get in trouble and it still happens. And also how very sensitive we are to that information in the voice. You may not have realised if I hadn't told you that she's starting to laugh because it can be harder to hear if you're not a native English speaker as it would be for any, it's easier to hear any of these things when you're the native speaker of a language. But it's also quite striking that you'll have heard there was something happening. There was some change in her emotional state. And that's the power of these emotional influences on the sounds that we make when we speak. And just to reflect back, I mean, laughter is an ex interesting example because this is not somebody laughing now in our scanners. So you can see what's happening inside her head. And can you see how different it is to speech? There's none of that complexity. She's just opening her mouth. The tongue's sitting at the bottom of the mouth. 
she's shaking up and down because you do quite a lot of work at the ribcage when you laugh but there's no this is more like an animal call basically than it is like speech and actually it peppers human speech it's comfortably the most commonly encountered uh, non-verbal emotional vocalization is laughter and it's an interesting one because again like speech it lives in these social interactions as i said you're 30 times more likely to laugh if there's someone else with you than if you're on your own so speech and laughter are both very important ways that we communicate with other people and which feeds back to that point i made at the top that things like laughter and this interaction of communication are the sorts of things that particularly with friendship are having these beneficial effects on our lives and on our health just a quick point um this is just to show that laughter is is linguistically universal um this is some recordings we made in namibia a few years ago this is someone recording stimuli for us he's making some triumphant sounds and listen what happens when his friends start laughing <laughs> <laughs> So it is a in many ways a highly universal behaviour. Um, and there's also some very interesting things. I mean, I, I'm emphasising the voice, but this the communicative use of humans. It also extends to our face. We are like engines for communication. So, for example, human faces are very, very different from the faces of other animals. They're very diverse in their appearance, so they have the same features. Those exact features can be different in sort of their, their exact placement, uh, their exact structure. Our faces are much flatter than the faces of even other primates, which kind of gives us a very... Um, like a kind of flat space for using the expressiveness of faces. And our faces are really expressive. We have a lot of facial muscles and we have a lot of voluntary control over them. And we use them for lots of reasons, but primarily for communication. Um, we have eyebrows. Lots of other animals don't have eyebrows. We have hairless faces. So it's perhaps easier to think that we return to there. And we use that for things like eyebrow flashes. People will do very, very small movements of their eyebrows to indicate that they've seen someone like across a room or when they're meeting someone or they bump into someone on the street. It's a tiny movement, but it's very, very, very salient. And it's salient because our eyebrows are clear structures on our face. We have large eyes with visible sclera. And what that means is we are the only animals that have visible whites of our eyes all the time. And that's because, as I hinted earlier, we use eyes not only to look at things, but also socially. So we'll use our eyes to indicate who we're talking to and we'll use our eyes to indicate what we're talking about. We also have the only animals that have chins and we don't really know why. I suspect it might be. So other animals have got lower jaws but they don't have this bony prominence beneath it. They just have the lower jaw and then that holds the teeth in place. And there's no structural reason for it. You don't need a chin for speech. You don't need a chin for chewing. And my suspicion is, if you think about the symmetry of a human head, you have the eyes coming down about halfway down the head. I suspect what jaws might be doing well, chins might be doing, is actually balancing out the appearance of our faces. If we didn't have chins there, things would be ending somewhat sooner, and perhaps a bit too soon to be truly aesthetically pleasing. And of course, our faces are very good ways of expressing emotional states. Our eyes, sorry, our, our facial expressions can be, even if we're not intending to, very, very indicative of our emotional states. And we use that communicatively. And we also, there is some difference between spontaneity and more uh, controlled use of these expressions. So here's a picture of the psychologist, Paul Ekman, who did a huge amount of work on this. Which of these smiles looks nicer? Well, if you block out the eyes, it's easier to see that actually the mouths are the same in those two pictures. It's the eyes that are different. It's hard to see that because of how we process faces. But the people often say that the face on the right looks nicer because, in fact, the smile looks nicer. It's not the smile. It's actually the eyes. The eyes on the left are from a neutral facial expression and it's been edited onto the face. And it gives you a smile that looks colder than this more, spot, more, more genuine apparent smile. And there is work showing that when people smile spontaneously, it tends to look more like the face on the right. And when people laugh uh, to command, because you told them to, sorry, smile to command, you see, you see something that looks a bit colder, the eyes, muscles are less involved. We found the same thing with laughter. So if you listen to a laugh that is spontaneous, hang on. <laughs> that really is someone laughing and then they can't help it it's very different from a laughter where someone's been told told to laugh 
I mean, that laugh is not unpleasant. And actually, most of the conversational laugh you encounter is more like that one. But people are people are good at spotting the authenticity in an emotional expression. And that's all kind of feeding into the, the, the fact that we these social networks, these friendships, these things that are so important in our lives, the things that largely mediate them are interactions where we talk with each other and that's something that we generally call conversation and it is the dominant mode for social interactions all around the world even in a world that is largely more and more digital opportunities what we like to do is to talk to people where we can see them and hear them and ideally be in the same place as them global pandemics notwithstanding and that's where talk lives that's where most talk happens and that's where most laughter happens we tend to think of laughter as being something that's totally driven by humor and comedy but actually most laughter happens in social interactions and this is getting again getting back to one of these engines for why these friendship interactions they're not helping you in an abstract way they're helping you in a direct way by being this engine for social bonding but also for enjoyable behavior like talking like laughing like dancing and it's extraordinary how incredibly cued in we are from the moment we're born into the kind of engine for conversations. So babies learn to talk in conversations. We learn a lot of things about our lives and our world through conversations. And here's just a picture of my son, very, very new, hasn't been around very long. I'm talking to my mum and just look at how he's focusing on her eyes. He's absolutely engaged in that interaction, although he's very young and obviously he's not doing anything else but, but the, that, that being talked to, being part of this interaction really matters to us right from the immediate deep, as soon as we're born, it matters. And it's very interesting to think about, you know, the ways that conversations matter and what happens in conversations, because we don't just blast speech and laughter at each other in conversations. It's much more like a kind of dance where there is no music and we are making up our own rhythm and music as we go along in the interaction. So, for example, as soon as you start talking to someone, you start to align all kinds of behaviour with them. So you start to breathe together. You start to align the rhythm of your speech. You start to align the melody and the pitch of your voice. And you will start to mimic quite large scale aspects of the interaction. So you get things like postural congruence where people will actually, without necessarily realising they're doing it, start adopting the same physical postures as each other. So this is again, this alignment. And the more we like someone, the more this happens. So the more that you like somebody that you're talking to, the more that you will use the same words as them, the same grammar as them, the same body language as them, the same tone, the same accent in the speech. So can we use anything of what we've seen here to think about why this would matter and how we can actually use it to help ourselves have better conversations? If friendship is merely mattering and social networks really matter, not just as ways of expressing information, but as ways of actually sort of giving us a stronger link to our social world and to the benefits we'll get from that. Well, there are some things that we can think about that can make a big difference. So how to really listen. Think about what happens when you're in an interaction. How do you communicate? What's your mood? What is your body language conveying? What does your voice sound like? What do you actually being there in that interaction what are you expressing to the other person that you're with and it really helps to just pay a little bit of attention to how not only you are expressing yourself when you speak but also how you are listening so it really helps to be an active listener don't half have an you know your phone out or be doing something else be an active listener focus pay attention to what people are saying How are people communicating with you beyond the words they say? So we tend to think, as I said right at the top, that talking is about language and talking is about language, but there's all this other information there. What else is going on in that interaction? How does the person sound? What's their mood? What's their body language? What are they saying? And also, what are they not saying to you? Show that you're listening. Use eye contact. And eye contact is difficult because there are cultural differences in how it's used. And of course, what you don't want to do is just be staring at somebody fixedly because that's almost uh, too much and somewhat threatening. But, you know, just showing you're there and you're looking in their direction and you, you are your, your attention is focused on them in that way. You can nod along. 
you're not being asked to agree with everything they say, but to show that you are listening, be engaged, give feedback, summarize what someone said, ask for clarifications about what they've said, say what you think you're hearing. Are you hearing the right thing? And where possible, don't interrupt people. I mean, this can be hard, particularly when things get a bit more emotional, that it just can help help for people to feel like they have been heard. And if one of the ways to be heard is to have a chance to speak without interruption. And don't denigrate it. It's one of the, we tend to think social stuff, it's the least important part of our day. You know, we, we could be working or improving or, you know, ourselves by reading a book or doing something noble. But actually, these moments where we share social interactions with other people and we talk with other people, we break bread with other people, we spend time with other people, we are not just making, maintaining our social bonds with our friends and our social network, we are actually engaging in something that is good for us in the moment and will have important effects on our health down the line. So for example, work with married couples, and I don't see why this wouldn't affect, be true of friendship more generally, shows that in stressful times, couples who use positive emotions like laughter and smiling to deal with a stressful conversation not only feel less stressed but they are also the couples who stay together for longer and are happier and have fewer health problems this is work by robert levinson in the U us so in fact and, and, and very strikingly it's not because like laughter is a bit of magic dust that makes everything okay because it only works if both members of the couple laugh so you're kind of negotiating a reason to regulate your emotional state in a more positive direction which most makes you feel better as a result because you get away from the stressful thing but it's like the laughter and the ability to use laughter in this way is an index of the strength of the relationship. It's not the laughter that's keeping the couples together. It's the couples in the stronger relationships who are able to use laughter in this way. And as I say, I don't think this is limited to romantic relationships. I think this is often what we mean by friendship, people with whom we can negotiate this better mood. And it's not just important in the moment, although it's important to deal with stress in the moment, but it is associated with other benefits. It is associated with less stress, happier relationships and with better health. And when you are listening to someone and that's not working, why is that? What is if a conversation feels like there's something missing, something's wrong, something's off? We are very good at picking this up. Are the words that they're saying at odds with the tone of their voice or their face or their body? Is there some mismatch between the way that you're both interacting? These could be signs that there's something else to know about. There's some other emotion going on behind the words that are, things that are not being said or behind the intentions about what's going on. Clarify what you think might be happening. See, ask for help. Am I right about this? Summarise what you're picking up. And it's important to remember there's no magic bullet for this. In its best form, interactions and conversations are almost like mind reading because they feel effortless. No one gets good at this overnight and it's never going to be possible in all conversations with all people. But it probably shouldn't be. It probably matters that you have more close conversations with the people that you are close to. We learn a bit about this by doing it. We learn by talking. We learn by listening, listening to ourselves as much as listening to other people. And it's really important to bear in mind that this is what our brains have evolved to do. The human brain is amazing at a phenomenal number of things and psychologists tend to get really interested in the abstract stuff but we really are machines for communication and our brains are continuously trying to work out what other people mean what other people intend how we can best understand what they are doing so let your brain do its work thank you very much for your time <laughs>